Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, French Connection, the Negritude Movement. In February of 1976, the president of Senegal flew to the Caribbean, where he visited Haiti, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. This was a special occasion for a number of reasons. Both then and now, it is not often that African presidents make official visits to the countries and territories of the Caribbean, in spite of the obvious ancestral connection linking the majority of the people of the Caribbean to Africa. Another obvious connection between the West African country of Senegal and the three places in the Caribbean that the president visited is that all are French-speaking. Haiti, as we have discussed in previous episodes, gained its independence from France in 1804 but retained French as its official language. Guadeloupe and Martinique, on the other hand, did not gain independence, but rather became integral parts of France as overseas departments in 1946. The political figure in Martinique, who was most prominently involved in the process of that island's departmentalization, remained the most important political figure on the island in 1976 as well, since he was both the mayor of Fort de France, Martinique's capital, and a representative of Martinique in the French National Assembly. The visiting Senegalese president and Martinique's most important political figure were old friends, making this not merely a diplomatic visit, but a happy reunion. The name of the Senegalese president was Leopold Sédar Senghor, born in 1906 in the town of Joual in Senegal. The name of the mayor and member of the French parliament was Aimé Césaire, born in 1913 in the town of Baise Point on the island of Martinique. Born seven years and an ocean apart from each other, they became close friends and collaborators in the 1930s while pursuing their education in Paris. As important as their later political careers would be, they are best known among historians of Africana thought as founders of the artistic and intellectual movement known as Negritude. Senghor and Césaire were so influential as poets, politicians, and philosophers that we will be devoting a further episode to each of them. We should note, however, that retellings of the birth and development of Nicotude usually count Senghor and Césaire as two of the three members of a so-called Holy Trinity. The third member, and indeed the one who originated the Trinity comparison, is Léon Gontran Damas. He was born in 1912 in Cayenne, the capital of French Guiana, a part of South America that also became an overseas department of France in 1946. Damas knew Césaire even before the Paris years of the 1930s, as he attended high school in Martinique. Like Senghor and Césaire, Damas was a poet, politician, and philosopher. Indeed, he too served as a representative in the French Parliament. We'll be discussing him in today's episode, but without reducing the movement to this holy trinity of Senghor, Césaire, and Damas. Tracy Sharpley Whiting's 2002 book, Negritude Women, made a huge mark on the study of the movement by highlighting the contributions of three remarkable Martinican women, Paulette Nadal, Paulette's younger sister Jane Nadal, and Suzanne Césaire, who was the wife of Aimé Césaire. We will present Suzanne's contributions later along with those of her husband, but Paulette and Jane Nardal will get their time in the spotlight in this episode. Let us return, though, to Senghor's visit to Martinique in 1976, as the speech he gave on that occasion looked backward to the birth of Negritude. He began the speech by insisting that, president though he was, he had not come to talk politics. For one thing, he explained, it is not the policy of Senegal to meddle in the affairs of other countries. But there was also another more important reason. Senghor said, Ever since the 1930s, more than 40 years ago, I have always placed culture before politics. That which distinguished us at that time, by us I mean the small group of students who began the Negritude movement, including Aimé Césaire and Léon Damas, is that we thought, and I still think, that politics must be at the service of culture, and not culture at the service of politics, as, alas, too many politicians and even writers of the Third World believe. This striking statement is helpful for beginning to grasp what Negritude is. Controversially, it embraces Black culture as being of primary importance in the advancement of Black people. It is a movement with important precedents, as Senghor himself recognizes on other occasions. Edward Blyden's pioneering cultural nationalism, 
whose influence on English-speaking West Africans we have explored, and a Julia Cooper's view on the specialization of races in different ways of life, which influenced Du Bois's celebrated essay, The Conservation of Races, and of course the cultural movement of the Harlem Renaissance, which exerted a direct influence on this new movement. In fact, it is not so easy to draw a clear boundary between the Harlem Renaissance and Negritude. There were many points of intellectual connection and exchange between New York and Paris, understood as centers of black intellectual culture during the 1920s and 1930s. Brent Hayes Edwards has captured many of these connections and exchanges in his book, The Practice of Diaspora, Literature, Translation, and the Rise of Black Internationalism, noting that almost every major figure of the Renaissance spent some time in Paris in the 1920s. Edwards also highlights a significant path of influence going in the opposite direction across the ocean, the interest among figures of the Renaissance in René Marin's book Batoile, which was published in 1921 just before the Renaissance began to flourish. Marin was born to parents from French Guiana in Martinique. His father was a colonial clerk who was transferred to French Equatorial Africa, and after Marin was educated in France, he returned to Africa to work in the colonial administration of Ubangi Shadi, the colony that would eventually become, after independence, the Central African Republic. It is here, right in the middle of Africa, while working as part of the French colonial regime, that Maran wrote the novel Batoile. It tells the story of an aging chief, his people's way of life, his conflict with a younger rival, and his criticisms of the European colonial presence. To the shock of most, and the dismay of many, the novel was awarded with the most prestigious of all the French literary prizes, the Prix Goncourt, making Maran the first black writer to win such a prize. The book's unexpected success got him in trouble thanks to its preface, which directly criticized the mistreatment of Africans under French colonial policy. He thus resigned from his position and began pursuing the life of a writer in France. Batoile was celebrated as an exciting achievement by figures representing diverse viewpoints within the Harlem Renaissance. Du Bois held it as momentous in his contribution to The New Negro, while his enemy, Marcus Garvey, did the same in a speech at a UNIA convention. Jesse Redmond Fawcett raved about it in Du Bois's Crisis magazine, while William H. Ferris, J. A. Rogers, and Hubert Harrison each lauded it in Garvey's Negro World. Alain Locke discussed it in a piece for the National Urban League's magazine Opportunity, a piece that was, in a rare move, reprinted in Garvey's magazine as well. Apparently, among these intellectuals, who were often quick to disagree with and criticize each other, a black Frenchman writing about African culture and colonialism offered the perfect path to consensus. Marin eventually ended up in contact with a number of his American admirers. His correspondence with Locke was particularly extensive, including open letters between the two, published in Opportunity. This facilitated a relationship between Opportunity and a French newspaper that Marin helped to edit, called Les Continents, meaning the continents. The founder of this journal was Prince Kojo Tovalu Ueno, a lawyer and activist from what is now Benin. At one point, both Opportunity and Les Continents published a poem by County Cullen entitled The Dance of Love After Reading René Marin's Batoile, yet another example of the work's rapturous reception. Good reviews are one thing, but it's the rare book that gets people dancing. Les Continents, even in its title, showed the ambition to span different parts of the globe. Unfortunately, it didn't even span different years, as it began and then ceased publication over the course of 1924. Nevertheless, it would serve as a precedent for other periodicals that were pivotal in the history of Negritude. Another important context for our story is that classic French venue of intellectual exchange, the Salon. Marin's apartment in Paris served as an important gathering place, as did the house belonging to the Nadal sisters, Paulette and Jane. Paulette Nadal, born in 1896, was the eldest sister and the first to leave Martinique to study. She spent some time learning English in Jamaica before going to Paris to study English literature at the Sorbonne. After completing her thesis on Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, she went back to Martinique to teach, staying only briefly. She returned to Paris and began to pursue a passion for journalism. She wrote for a number of publications, such as La Dépêche Africaine, or The African Dispatch, which ran from 1928 to 1932 and was, early on, the clearest successor to Les Continents. Jane Nardal wrote for La Pêche Africaine as well, publishing in it arguably her most important work. 
She was born in 1902 and did prefer to be called Jane, though as one might guess, given that we're talking about francophones here, she was originally named Jean. Like her older sister, she became one of the first black women to study at the Sorbonne, in her case, classics and French literature. Attentive listeners of this podcast will recall that it was at the Sorbonne that she encountered Anna Julia Cooper, who was there to defend her dissertation on the Haitian Revolution. Jane described this meeting in a letter to Locke, who on some occasions attended the Clamant Salon, so called because the Nadal sisters' house was located in a suburb of Paris called Clamant. Besides Locke, others known to have visited from across the Atlantic include County Cullen, Claude McKay, and Carter G. Woodson. There were actually no fewer than seven Nodal sisters, and one more is also commonly identified with the Salon. This was André Nadal, the youngest of all, born in 1910, and not as educated or as prolific as Paulette and Jane, but still an interesting writer in her own right. On a personal note related to the history of Negritude, she once received a marriage proposal from none other than Senghor, who was said to have been quite smitten with her, and was mightily disappointed when she turned him down. In a letter reflecting on the origins of Negritude, written in 1960, the once lovelorn Senghor reminisced upon the Salon in this way. It was during the years 1929 to 1934 that we were put in contact with American Negroes through the intermediary of Mademoiselle Paulette Nadal, who, with Dr. Zajou, a Haitian, had founded the Revue du Monde Noir. Mademoiselle Nadal kept a literary salon where African Negroes, West Indians, and American Negroes used to get together. As Senghor reveals here, the lively intellectual atmosphere of the salon led directly to the creation of a new journal, La Revue du Monde Noir, or The Review of the Black World. It was edited collectively not only by Paulette Nadal and the Haitian that Senghor mentions, Léo Sajou, but also Jane, André, and two other contributors. Although it ran for only six issues over the course of 1931 to 1932, it was another major step in the development of a distinctive francophone approach to issues of race and culture. The influence of their salon as a meeting place is sometimes privileged over the important contributions that Paulette and Jane especially made through their writing. Though not the oldest, it was Jane whom first made a major philosophical contribution to the development of Negritude with her essay, Black Internationalism, published in the very first issue of La Depeche Africaine. In the wake of the First World War, she detects the emergence of a new interest and pride in being African among people of the diaspora, and a new sense of unity among Black people of all backgrounds. She reflects on the power of new names for one's people, holding up Afro-American and, for her own people of French West Indian heritage, Afro-Latin, as symbolic of the fruitful combination of African and Western culture. She praises the Afro-Americans as leading the way, having been spurred on in part by the harshness of American racism to maintain race solidarity and consciousness. She is no less excited about what young Afro-Latins are set to accomplish. Formed in European methods, they will take advantage of these methods in order to study the spirit of their race, the past of their race, with all the necessary critical verve. Paulette clearly builds upon her younger sister's thought in her 1932 essay, The Awakening of Race Consciousness Among Black Students, which was published in La Revue du Monde Noir. Like Jane, she looks to younger French West Indians to see progress, arguing that, with respect to pride in African descent, quasi-contemptuous indifference seems to have transformed itself into a startled interest among the older generation and a genuine enthusiasm among the younger. Especially fascinating is Paulette's observation that, among this younger generation, women in particular have been the true leaders. She looks back at the developments of the 1920s, from the success of Batoila to interest in Garvey to the creation of La Dépêche Africaine, which she treats as the point of emergence for a movement that culminates in La Revue du Monde Noir. She explains, The aspirations that were to crystallize around La Revue du Monde Noir asserted themselves among a group of Caribbean women students in Paris. The women of color living alone in the metropolis who until the colonial exposition of 1931 have been less favored than their male compatriots who have enjoyed easy successes, felt long before the latter the need for a racial solidarity that would not be merely material. They were thus aroused to race consciousness. Paulette suggests, in other words, that the marginalization of black women in France has wound up radicalizing them, 
which will ultimately prove useful for Black progress. As Tracy Sharply Whiting has pointed out, it makes sense to see Nadal as telling us here that women from the Caribbean were at the vanguard of the racialized cultural revolution that would later be called Negritude, and identified as male-inspired and forged. Now that the Nadal sisters are getting their due, the story of Negritude is no longer a male-centered one, of males inspiring males. Still, some male forging did happen at some point, which means it is time to make our way from Le Revue du Monde Noir to L'Étudiant Noir, or The Black Student, the periodical in whose pages we finally find the word Negritude being used for the first time. To do so is not to leave the Nadal sisters behind, though. Paulette contributed to L'Étudiant Noir as well, the only woman to do so in the two surviving issues of the journal we have. An even more short-lived journal was Légitime Défense, or Right of Self-Defense. It managed just one issue put together by Martinican students under the leadership of Etienne Glerot. It embraced communism and surrealism, viewing the latter as a way out of the confines of a bourgeois capitalist mindset. It is sometimes seen as prefiguring Nicotude, given its rejection of the assimilationist tendencies of the Martinican middle class. Senghor's speech in Martinique articulates his long-standing view that the Légitime Défense group and the L'Étudiant Noir group represented two opposed currents. We replied in the 1930s, despite the esteem we had for Leroux and his school, that their thesis ended up confusing culture and politics, or more precisely, subordinating culture to politics when it should have been the other way around. We recognized, and we recognize today, the priority of political action, not its primacy, as it is cultural action which has that. I will go further and claim that with respect to cultural vision, it must even have priority, again not over action, but over political vision. Senghor makes a slightly bewildering number of distinctions here. We can perhaps understand him as granting that political action demands our immediate attention, because the problems of politics, social inequality, the suffering of the oppressed, and so on, are so pressing. We are called to bring about change and do it now. Still, culture has primacy over politics because when we do have the chance to sit back and make a long-term plan for the future, we need a sense of where we are going culturally. This means that a political vision is worth adopting only because it promotes a broader cultural vision into which it can be fitted. This point helps in appreciating what Senghor and Césaire argue in their contributions to the first issue of L'Étudiant Noir. This journal had formerly been called L'Étudiant Martinique, the Martinican student, and the title page still identifies it as the Journal of the Association of Martinican Students in France. But they were repurposing the periodical as an announcement of the kind of black internationalism and awakening of race consciousness championed before them by Jane and Paulette Nadal. Césaire, for his part, launches a very direct attack on the desire to be like white people in his piece, Black Youth and Assimilation, which is placed under the hard-to-translate heading Negrerie. We might follow sharply whiting in rendering it as Of Things Negro. Césaire claims that while the tribe of the elders remain oriented towards assimilation, the youth reject this and say instead, Resurrection. He also divides Black history into a drama in three parts, beginning with enslavement. After enslavement, which is premised on treating Black people like animals, comes the kinder episode of assimilation, which is premised on treating Black people like children in need of education. What the youth are pressing for, according to Césaire, is the transition from assimilation to the final episode, emancipation, the treatment of Black people as adults who can choose their own path. Enslavement and assimilation, he points out, resemble each other as two forms of passivity. Senghor uses his portion of the first issue of L'Étudiant Noir to pay tribute to none other than René Marin, under the heading Humanism and Us. We will see in the episode to come on Senghor that he had an enduring attachment to the word humanism. For him, negritude is itself essentially a kind of humanism. In this piece on Marin, he speaks of humanism as that which must lead to the discovery and knowledge of self, and then defines black humanism as a cultural movement that has the black man as its aim and Western reason and the Negro soul as its tools of research, for both reason and intuition are necessary here. 
This association of reason with the West and intuition with the black soul would prove to become not only a prominent feature of Senghor's thought, but perhaps the most famous and controversial aspect of Nikotud thought more generally. There's much to be said about it, but for now, we'll just note that the idea of Western reason and the black soul as complementary tools of research is reminiscent of Jane Nardal's claim that the promise of Afro-Latin identity lies in using European methods to study the spirit of the black race. In the decades after this first issue of L'Etudiant Noir was published, existing copies of the journal gradually became hard to find. Lilian Kestelut, one of the first major historians of the Nicotude movement, wrote about the importance of L'Etudiant Noir without having had the opportunity to see a copy. Eventually, though, a copy of the first issue, dated March 1935, was found. For quite a while, scholars assumed that only this single issue had ever existed, as in the case of Légitime Défense, which led to skepticism regarding claims made by the founders of Nicotude. For example, where do we first find the word Nicotude in print? Senghor and Damas point to Césaire as the first to use it in L'Étudiant Noir, but it is not there in the inaugural issue. So scholars turned to Césaire's long poem, Notebook of a Return to My Native Land, first published in 1939 as the word's auspicious birthplace. Then too, while Léon Damas later spoke on multiple occasions about his involvement in L'Étudiant Noir, he is nowhere to be found in the March 1935 issue. One scholar joked that, in this sense, there is more truth than wit in Damas calling himself the Holy Ghost of Negritude's Trinity. How apt, then, that this episode is airing on Halloween, because Damas the Ghost now makes a surprise entrance. He contributed multiple poems to the May-June 1935 issue of L'Étudiant Noir, which identifies itself not as the second, but rather the third issue of the journal. About a decade ago, a scholar named Christian Filostra, who knew Damas, shared this issue of L'Étudiant Noir with the world by including a scan of it in his book, Negritude Agonistes. Césaire's contribution to this issue once again uses the heading Negrerie and takes as its title Racial Consciousness and Social Revolution. It is in this piece, which criticizes models of anti-capitalist revolution that dismiss the importance of Black cultural nationalism, that Césaire first uses the neologism that he invented to capture something like Negrohood or the state of being Negro. He writes, Thus, before accomplishing the revolution, and in order to accomplish the revolution, the real one, the destructive groundswell and not the shaking of surfaces, one condition is essential, breaking the mechanical identification of races, tearing up superficial values, seizing the immediate Negro within us, planting our negritude like a beautiful tree until it bears its most authentic fruits. In contrast to Césaire, Damas rarely used the term negritude, and still less did he define it. The 1972 interview in which he introduced the Trinity analogy points out that while Césaire coined the term, it was Senghor who became the father of negritude. This is because Senghor made the definition and elaboration of negritude his primary theoretical interest, whereas Césaire lacked this focus. The same goes for Damas, even though he was not infrequently the true pioneer of the trio. It was he who, in 1937, became the first of the three to publish a book of poetry. That book, Pigments, introduced readers to the negritude concern of resisting assimilation, as in the poem Söld, which begins, I feel ridiculous in their shoes, their dinner jackets, their starched shirts and detachable collars, their monocles and their bowler hats, and ends, I feel ridiculous among them, like an accomplice, like a pimp, like a murderer among them, my hands hideously red with the blood of their civilization. In the very next year, he became the first of the three to publish a book of prose. Retour du Guyane, or Return from French Guiana, is partly a result of ethnographic fieldwork that Damas did in his territory of origin for the Trocadero Museum. It also, and more importantly, looks at various aspects of French Guianese society and holds the colonial administration up to withering critical scrutiny. As a result, the book was banned in the French colonies. There are many other things that could be said about Damas as an intellectual force within the Negritude movement, but perhaps we should end by discussing his connection with one of the other places that Senghor visited during his 1976 tour of the Caribbean, Haiti. As Raylan Rabaka has highlighted in his book, The Negritude Movement, 
Damas wrote a series of articles in the 1960s on the brilliant Jean Price Mars, who is known especially for his study of Haitian folklore. We have said much about Negritude's connection to the Harlem Renaissance, but Damas is notable for drawing our attention to what he refers to as Haitianism and highlighting Price Mars as its champion. Having followed Senghor to Martinique and Haiti, however, it is time for us to follow the president home to Senegal and follow his story back in time to what he calls the kingdom of childhood in his poetry and his prose. Senghor can be called the most ambitious of the Negritude thinkers and also the most controversial. Some see him as an irredeemably problematic racial essentialist and one who was overly fond of Europe to boot. We will place both priority and primacy on providing a penetrating look at his life and work next time here on The History of Africana Philosophy. <laughs>